Uh, thank you for uh, attending tonight's uh, town hall informational meeting. A factual presentation will be given, and at the end of the presentation, a question and answer session. <clears throat> It'll all take place after they do their presentation, please. All of the information presented in this evening will be available on the Township website very shortly. A reminder to our trustees, sharing thoughts and opinions will be done at our regular board meeting, of which I encourage all residents, whenever they have the opportunity to either attend or tune into, on Tuesday, October 15th at 7 o'clock. Please be respectful of the professionals on this subject matter. This meeting is for public information. Thank you. And I would like to present at this time White Lake Township's DPS Director, Mr. Aaron Potter. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Aaron Potter. I'm the Public Services Director for White Lake Township. Um, tonight we're going to talk about um, recent notification from the state of Michigan about an exceedance in the lead and copper uh, action level in one of our two distribution districts in White Lake Township. So. So, White Lake Township recently constructed um, a new iron filtration plant known as the Village of Acres Iron Filtration Plant. Um, prior to, I'm going to give you a little background on our, I'm going to give you a little background history on, on our system here. Um, prior to iron filtration at Village Acres, White Lake Township was considered one serial numbered system uh, with one distribution system. So on your screen here, you should see a map of uh, the general layout of the township and, and the coverage area. Um, White Lake Township on a routine monitoring schedule um, does test our uh, source water wells for lead. Uh, no lead has been detected in our source water. Um, we conducted our lead and sample monitoring uh, for the entire system as one sampling pool. Um, and so then recently, after we've uh, constructed the Village Acres water treatment plant, and with other recent rule revisions to uh, both the lead and copper rule and uh, the requirement for optimization of corrosion control, uh, we, working with the state of Michigan, elected to split our distribution system into two districts. Um, again, we still continue to test our source water. No lead has been found in our source water wells. But we now have two distribution systems, as you should see on the, on the map. Mike, can you just let me know if that's... Okay. Uh, and as you can see, the... Yeah, we can't see what you can see, unfortunately. Yeah. A little technical difficulty there. All right, let me tell you what. Forward one more now? Okay. Mike, could you do me a favor and just kind of head on up to that area and assist those folks um, so that we can make sure that we're... Sorry, folks, we're having a little technical difficulty. As you can imagine, we're trying to get this public uh, education session uh, scheduled as soon as possible. And we are, um, you know, d with the volume of calls that we've been getting in our office, as you can imagine, we've uh, not had a lot of time to be out here on site. So as soon as they... Should be on number three, Mike. 
Okay, so everybody can see now, I think. Um, so presently, White Lake Township samples two separate distribution systems. They are connected uh, through a booster station occasionally during the summertime. However, we, we're treating these as two distinct separate systems for the purpose of all of our routine monitoring. The idea behind this was to reselect a larger sampling pool that more accurately represented uh, the population in each one of these areas. So we're going to go to number four now. So the township is currently working on future iron filtration plans for another plant in District 1, the northern half of the township. Again, we're still continuing to, to test our source drinking water wells uh, on a routine basis um, per our routine monitoring schedule that's provided to us through the state. Theoretically, after iron filtration was added back to um, Aspen Meadows, the entire township would have the same treatment processes, would have uh, no further reason to separate District 1 and District 2. Uh, and then, you know, at that time, I think that the idea is that we're going to uh, work with the state on uh, combining those districts back together. Um, at that time, we would go back to one larger sampling pool. So the DWRF project plan um, that you're seeing up here now uh, is a plan that we partnered with with um, Lakeland, with Huron Valley Schools Lakeland campus uh, to add iron filtration at Aspen Meadows and uh, extend water main down to this campus. Um, Village Acres is currently in operation. Um, with this additional plan, we would be able to supply the township with iron-free water, the entire township with iron-free water for the majority of the time. Um, so this would be the next project plan that we intend to work on. We've been working on this plan for approximately nine months with the school, and um, we intend to you know, move into the engineering phase of this very soon. Um, and uh, we'll be presenting this uh, at our township board meeting in the near future. So our current situation, um, again, our source waters have not uh, been found to contain well uh, lead in our well waters. Um, we do have the two distribution systems. Um, distribution system number two has recently uh, been found to be an exceedance of the action level. So what does that mean? Action level is a term that we use uh, part of the lead and copper rule that states uh, that um, samples above 10%, if we're found to have samples that are above 10% of the total number of samples that we collect in a district, if those samples are over the action level of 15 parts per billion, then that would be an exceedance of the action level, which is where we're at right now. So prior to our splitting of this distribution system, you've got a scale on the right-hand side the way this works is we would take all of our samples that we collected, we would arrange them in order of highest to lowest. At that 90th percentile, which in this case would be 30, so we would take 30 samples, multiply that by 0.9, our 27th highest sample is where we report uh, our lead concentration. So in this case, that would have been five parts per billion. That is not an action level exceedance. However, previous sample pools, we felt, didn't represent the population of the township in the areas where those populations lie. After we decided that the correct uh, solution at this time until these future plans could be accomplished uh, was to split these distribution systems into two um, so we took the, we did a population analysis based on our billing, 
um, did some calculation on multifamily residential, um, commercial. Came up with some numbers that we, we felt and the state felt represented our population to determine the number of samples taken in each district. So that conversation and the majority of that happened back uh, between May and uh, July. So typically we sample these systems between June and September during the hot months of the year uh, due to the increased temperature in the water makes, makes sampling of those, uh, those metals easier. So <clears throat> once we split these districts and we took these samples, uh, we contacted residents, we had to get some additional um, residents to participate. So we had an online form, which we still have on our website, that folks could sign up to, to participate. And we collected these samples that, that met the criteria of the state. In distribution system one, on the map on your upper left, or I'm sorry, on the, the map that we saw on the previous slide, we had no uh, DTECs over the action level. However, in distribution system two, we had three DTECs over the action level. Now, three samples out of 20 um, put our 90th percentile at our 18th sample which is 21 parts per billion over the action level. Now that triggers this public advisory and everything that we've been doing this week um, as uh, a public education campaign to notify folks that we've identified that there is possibly uh, an issue there. So I'm going to my next slide here, Mike. So our sequence of events, just to kind of go over a quick recap here. Um, prior to July 2019, we had one distribution system. Uh, sampling period typically is June, 9, June to September, so our sampling period would have been June to September. Um, during May through July, we worked with the state to identify a more accurate representation in our sampling pool. So we were issued an updated monitoring schedule on July 17th um, that we put, you know, instituted the two separate systems. So most of our original sites fell in District 1, and so that uh, triggered the need for the township to locate 16 new sampling sites for distribution system number two. Uh, September 19th, uh, we received our final field sample from uh, the last resident to complete their sampling. So let's talk about that a little bit. So typically the way this sampling is done is we will hand out the bottle to folks that are interested in participating in the lead and copper sampling. What we're looking for are homes that we know have lead in them. Um, so White Lake Township doesn't have what the state would consider any tier one sites that we know of. We don't have any lead service lines in the township that we know of. Our system isn't that old um, where those, those materials were pre you know, prevalently used in um, the construction of service lines. We don't have um, multifamily residential sites that we think have lead service lines that we know of. Um, there are always a portion that we, um, you know, maybe don't have uh, records on, and, and that's something that's uh, updated on a continuous basis and continues to be updated. So what we do have are a lot of what the state calls Tier 3 sites. These sites are homes that were built before 1988 um, that would have contained copper plumbing with lead solder. So lead solder was the uh, approved connection material for copper plumbing back in, in that time period uh, per the plumbing code. So we look for sites that uh, we know have that. On our online form, what we're asking for are people that are interested in participating, name, address, and year home was built. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea on why we're asking that, when was that, when was that home built, because we know already that those sites have lead there in that solder. Specifically what we're looking for 
is the effectiveness of our corrosion control with the sampling that we do through um, our monitoring schedule. So next, next slide. So we had these three results that were over the action level. Um, we've gone through uh, quite an increase in, in monitoring of lead and copper in the last few years. Um, our last sampling was done in 2017. We collected 20 samples in 2017. We had no exceedances in the lead action level. 2018 we did, because we added the iron filtration plant at Aspen Meadows, uh, we did some additional sampling there as required under the state because we changed the chemistry. Um, so we did two rounds of what is called increased monitoring. And those two rounds would, were 40 samples each. Now, the majority of those two rounds used the well, all of the 2017 sites were used again if those folks were still interested in participating. That's the key. Um, we do require that participation from our residents to um, take the time to do these samples for us, and we appreciate their, their efforts on that. Um, the instructions do require them to bypass their water softeners for a day. Uh, they'll use their water normally for one day. And then they require a six-hour hold time where no water can be used. Samples have to be collected at either the kitchen sink or the main bathroom in the house. And the samples are a first draw sample, meaning as soon as they get up or as soon as they come home from work, whenever that six hour hold time period was, the very first water out of that tap goes straight into our jar. And then that is, uh, those residents will call the township and either drop that sample off to us, or if we have folks available in the area, we'll go and pick that up. Now, then those samples were taken to the state uh, EGLE Drinking Water Laboratory in Lansing, and all the analysis on that uh, sample was done at the, at the state laboratory. So, currently, because of this action level exceedance, we're working directly with Oakland County and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to facilitate um, what they call a lead investigation because we've, we've had some high results at these sites. We offer this every time we get a, a lead exceedance. In 2018, we did have uh, one resident that was interested in, in doing that sampling. Uh, in that incidence, we had uh, Paragon Laboratories do our retesting for us, uh, and, our, and that sample came back as a non-detect. So uh, in that sample, it was determined that her first sample was taken at the kitchen sink. Her second sample was taken at her main bathroom sink. Her kitchen sink sample came back over the action level. Her main bathroom sink came back as non-detect. So. She was comfortable um, with the idea that, you know, there may be um, a faucet there that was built prior to some regulation that went into effect in 2014 called NSF 61, um, where, where household brass fittings had, you know, contained a portion, a percentage of lead, and that NSF 61 regulation reduced that proportion down to uh, a very small amount. So this time around, because this is an action level exceedance and we're trying to be 100% uh, 100 per, 100 transparent on, on what we found here and what we're doing about it, we've elected to work with Department of uh, Health and Human Services and Oakland County to have county officials go in the home and do a lead investigation. So what they're going to do is go in and do, um, collect a number of samples throughout the home at different fi fixtures, uh, and then they will let some of that water run where they're pulling you know, several pints of water out of the water main and testing that for lead. So then they can get a very good idea. It's a, it's a broader panel of testing than we normally do on, on the, uh, the state's testing. And that way we'll get, um, I think, a very good picture on where lead is in the home and where it may be coming in contact with the drinking water at, at a higher than normal level. 
So just kind of a, a recap. Um, we've done our routine monitoring on our groundwater wells. Uh, and that sample, um, that sampling is not turned up uh, any detects of lead in our groundwater wells. So this is where I'm going to kind of uh, transition into uh, some of the Q&A and I think maybe some of these folks from the state, um, if they want to say something uh, in here. So where is this lead coming from? Uh, again, we think we know where the lead is coming from. Uh, we specifically sample homes that were built before 1988, specifically because we know those samples to be most likely lead solder. Um, uh, drinking water faucets manufactured before 2014 uh, were allowed to contain up to 8% of lead. Uh, that made the lead more, more pliable, allowed those fittings to be threaded tighter. Um, currently, after NSF 61, that uh, amount has gone down to less than 1%. Um, so again, that went into effect in 2014. So when we go out and do our sample site selection, we're looking for homes that are built before 1988, have copper plumbing, preferably have copper service lines. Uh, if we can't get participation um, from, from folks that have that, then we would go to what we would call others where then we start specifically looking for homes that would be built before 2014 that would have lead, or I'm, I'm sorry, not lead, copper service lines. Um, and in some cases, we'll, we'll have to go even further or have in the past um, with the other category, and, and maybe we can't find folks that have copper service lines to participate. And at that point, we would look for homes that were uh, built prior to 2014 with plastic service lines. Again, the sampling pool, we look for the lead. That's the whole idea with the sampling pool. We're out there looking for lead to measure the effectiveness of corrosion control that we already have here in White Lake Township. So, talk a little bit about um, the public education um, that's out there and, and what people can do uh, to minimize the uh, exposure to this uh, lead that may or may not be in your home already. Um, the first and, and easiest thing that you can do is just simply flush your pipes. If you turn on your faucet, um, the health department recommends 30 seconds to two minutes. Um, you'll reduce a lot of that exposure. Again, that, that lead slowly would leach into that water or could potentially slowly leach into that water over a period of time. That's kind of why we do the, the six hour hold time. Um, or why the, why the state and the rule requires the six-hour hold time. We're looking for that leaching to see if it's taking place. Um, simply by running your faucet, that can be mostly eliminated. Um, so this would kind of hold true also for, um, you know, any kind of use in your home where you're using water, taking a shower, running a load of laundry, running the dishwasher, is going to run that faucet. Uh, that that's going to pull all that water through your service line, and you're going to be getting fresh water out of the main uh, within just a few minutes. Um, water filters. There's, as you guys all probably noticed when you walked in, um, the health department is outside. They've got a variety of water filters out there. Um, the health department is handing out water filters to low-income folks that may have pregnant women or uh, children in the home that can't afford to purchase a water filter. But they have a lot of public uh, education materials out there to talk about what types to get. Uh, the water filters that they have are, uh, are very easy to install. They just thread onto your, um, your, your main faucet. Um, they cost about, you know, $30-ish. Uh, you can get them at any hardware, Home Depot, Walmart. The key thing to look for with those water filters is that they state on them that they are NSF or uh, ANSI 
standard 53, which are standards that um, are designed to, to remove lead. So uh, cold water or flushed water for drinking, cooking, uh, or rinsing food. So the same thing that we talked about with flushing the water. After you flush that water, there's, there's a lot less lead there that, that could have potentially leached into that from uh, lead solder. And so, you know, that will minimize the amount, say if you're washing fruit or something like that, let that thing run for a couple seconds and then wash your, your fruit and you'll, you'll reduce the exposure. Um, you definitely want to do that if you're mixing um, infant formula, uh, brushing your teeth, same kind of thing. Um, so all these things obviously don't mean that you need to stand there and flush your tap for two minutes every single time you turn it on. But I think it's good practice for most folks, whether you're on a private well or township water, any home that's built before 1988 will have this solder if you have copper plumbing uh, because it was the you know approved plumbing code material at the time back then so it, it's just good practice and, and generally um, widely distributed uh, public education material um, that's been out for quite a long time but uh, you know as Lead and copper uh, is more understood, and you know, unfortunately, um, you know, there, there's been some other larger cities in our general area that that have had some issues with this, and um, you know, they've they've had to work very hard to correct those issues. But these practices can be put in place by anybody that lives in a in an older home, and it will drastically reduce the amount of exposure that you have to lead from your plumbing. So um, when to use unfiltered and non-flushed water? Uh, showering or bathing is fine. Lead is, you're not gonna come in contact with lead, you're not going to ingest lead unless you're drinking water while you're in the shower. Um, if uh, you're brushing your teeth while you're standing in the shower, something weird like that, you might wanna think about a different method. Um, but you know, generally bathing and things like that, you're gonna be all right washing hands, dishes, and clothes, you're, you're probably going to be okay. And cleaning, you're probably going to be okay. Um, so that kind of concludes uh, my presentation here tonight. I just want to follow up, and so I, I'll close with uh, the statement that you're seeing on your, your last side, slide here. I've talked a lot about public education and this information. Um, I've given you one website here. We have also uh, quite a few links on our township website. There's also a number here for um, the Department of Health and Human Services um, that you can contact to talk about this stuff um, if, you're, if you're interested. You can certainly call the township. I know many of you have. We've had um, quite a few calls, which we expected after these findings. Um, so these findings obviously are not what we wanted to find. Um, we're, we're very excited about the work that the township is doing. Um, we've, we've spent a lot of time and effort to improve our, our water quality here in the township, and we're continuing to do so. Um, you know, these recent rule revisions, um, under these recent rule revisions and, you know, additionally working with the, the state to make sure that we're uh, doing the right things for our residents. It, you know, we, we made a decision to split this distribution and the sample pool into two districts because we felt like it was the right thing to do and we wanted to be testing a representative sample. Now that we've done that, we've got this action level exceedance. Is that a good thing or a bad thing at this point? Well, uh, I think uh, from the, you know, scare tactics, or maybe not the scare tactics, but the, put it this way, the public is afraid of these, what this means. And, you know, we're very confident that we have the processes in place, no matter what we find here. Um, one of the major differences that we have with some of these other cities that they have had DTEX is that we don't have lead service lines in our system. 
um, with this new iron filtration plant, we've already installed corrosion control. Um, so we do have corrosion control in our system. And um, so we're very confident that, you know, although these aren't the results that we wanted to find, um, we're very confident that worst case scenario, uh, what we could be possibly talking about here is an adjustment in a corrosion control dose. Um, you know, we're going to resample these homes and, and publish those results as well, just in an effort to be transparent about this. Um, whether or not those samples, those repeat samples come back as a, a, a higher than normal a detection of lead, we don't know. And we're gonna to continue to keep working with the state to make sure that our corrosion control is optimized. So we feel like we've got all the mechan mechanisms in place to, to handle this. We've got the right people at the state and at the county assisting us with this, uh, as they always have been. And we're going to continue to um, provide safe drinking water and, and continue to improve the quality of our drinking water and the operation of our, of our system. So, you know, I'd like to uh, lastly just state that, um, you know, our, our residents here, rightly so, when they hear um, some of the local news stations say that we found lead in our, our drinking water, um, you know, I have been afraid and we've gotten a lot of response from you folks and I think that we'd like to continue on with this. We, we had this town hall meeting tonight to make sure that we're addressing you all folks directly. We're going to give everybody an opportunity to uh, ask us all questions. We'll try to answer all of those questions and, uh, you know, I, I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, we're, we're going to continue to work on this until we found out exactly what's happened, if anything has happened, and uh, we'll continue to work on it until it's fixed. Uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, offer the opportunity for anybody to jump in with any follow-up. Uh, first off, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Brandon Onan. I'm with the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, formerly known as the Department of Environmental Quality. Um, I am the lead and copper unit supervisor in the drinking water division, and I brought with me my lead and copper rules specialist, Jenny Bolt. Um, I'd like to just say thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to sit here and speak with you about lead and copper and what's kind of going on in your community and what this all means. Because there's a, it seems like a lot, right? You get a lot of information very quickly, and I want to help you digest this to make this so that you can very easily understand what's happening, where we're going, and what you can do to make sure that you're you're safe. So I, I guess we'll, I, I'll turn it over to Aaron, but I, I think what we're looking for is for people to um, come up and ask your questions at any one of these microphones here, and, and we'll do our best to see what we can do to answer your question. Go ahead if you wanna just try to shout it out. We'll see if we can hear it. I think you can. Well, what he was, if you don't mind, what he was saying is that you don't have lead service lines. Every, every home has a service line. So I'll, I'll, I'll define that for you, what that means. So a service line, there's big water mains running out in the roadway. There's smaller lines that come off from that big water line and go to each home. That water line that goes from the water main to the home, that's what we call a service line. So in White Lake Township here, you guys don't have lead service lines. You have copper and plastic service lines. In Flint, they had lead service lines. In lead service lines, obviously there's a lot of lead there, so it can be a huge exposure path because you've got a lot of lead in contact with water. It's a way for the lead to get into water and then make its way into the home. So they're still currently actually removing those lines in Flint and, and getting rid of that source. With, with what he's trying to tell you here is that you don't have that scenario, but you're not, but you do have other sources of lead. And those other sources of lead are typically from plumbing that's in the homes. 
So back before 1988, when they would put copper in to a home, they would use leaded solder because leaded solder flows very nice. It works very well because that lead is very malleable. So when you heat it up, it, it flows into that joint very well, makes a nice tight seal. But that can then come in contact with the drinking water and then put lead into your drinking water. It's less of a source than a lead service line is, but it's still a source. So anybody who has copper that was installed before 1988 likely has that source of lead in their home. Another place for lead is fixtures that have brass in them. Brass is an alloy that's made up of copper, zinc, and lead in different percentages. For brass to be malleable enough to be able to be workable, it has to have a lead content. In the stuff before 2014 had a higher lead content than the stuff after 2014. So those are probably your two primary sources of lead in your community. So what we can do is try to make sure that the water is at a state that is less likely to pick lead up from those objects. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes. Sure, up here. So the way that we absolutely, I'm sure he would love to have your results so that he can understand the system as a whole. As far as the state goes, we have a very prescribed period of time and a very prescribed style of home that we're looking for samples to come from. So for it to count in towards what we're calling the 90th percentile, so the compliance calculation, that you would have had to have had the right tier home and you would have had to have had it sampled within the monitoring period, which is from June to September. So because we're past that. In the monitoring period, I am in the, you know, I have the right tier home. Okay. Would you want the results or not? Yeah, sure, we would Absolutely. love to see the result. All I was saying is it, 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 it can't comply or it, it doesn't comply with the monitoring period we just closed out of. And then we're gonna be in a little bit of a lull here. We'll absolutely love to take the result. Then we start sampling more aggressively in January. We're gonna double the number of sites and we're gonna do it in two six month rounds instead of once annual. Yes, just contact the, uh, Aaron, are you currently looking Yeah, absolutely. We, um, we, if you're interested in parts, or if anyone is interested in participating in our next round of lead and copper sampling, um, we're looking for homes older than 1988, but I think uh, at this time, I would recommend that anybody that's interested sign up. Um, and that form is available on our township uh, website, water department page, or you can simply call up the township, you know, or send us an email. We, you, we'll, we have a lot of different ways that we'll, we'll get you on the list. But we are absolutely, as a matter of fact, we have a sign up if you're interested in, you can sign up before you leave here tonight. There's a paper on that table right where you walked in. But anybody that has in-home results that they take, we're certainly uh, interested in, in those sample results because that's all data. Even though it's not going to count towards any percentile or um, you know, any compliance issues, that's all data that we are interested in getting um, as Brandon said, more data is better than less data, always. So we wanna, we wanna have that information coming back to us so that you know, we can get a better understanding of things that might be going on in the system. And you know, depending on what that data looks like, we might then you know, recommend that you, know, you contact uh, us or Oakland County Health Division or any number of the um, laboratories in the area or the state of Michigan to, you know, to get some opinion on what those results may mean. Yeah, back there. And then we'll, then we'll come to you, sir. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, so say I live in distribution two, and say I get tested in January, and we get a bunch of people in the Jakers to get tested. And our pipes are soldered with uh, lead. Is this a county thing? I mean, are we paying thousands of dollars to get new plumbing in our homes? Or, I mean, what, how is this going to be handled? Are we all screwed and we're going to like leave our homes because 
<laughs> no. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very good question. It is a very good question. Sure. The, as, as Aaron was saying through his presentation, you guys are in a... No, no problem. And it, there was a lot of information, so it's easy to kind of get lost in everything that came at you. So no worries. We'll, we'll answer the question. So um, you guys are kind of set up in a good situation already as a, as a community because you have corrosion control treatment in place. So what we're looking at now that we've kind of got a better sample set or a more representative sample set is we may have to tweak the corrosion control to get better control of it. So you won't have to go through and replace all your plumbing. If you want to, that would be more protective. Wait, but it has lead, I mean, would we have to replace it? Or are we just going to resolder all of our piping? I mean, that's like tearing up Right, house. right. No, I understand. So how corrosion control treatment works is when we properly treat the water, it essentially makes a coating on the inside of the pipes that makes a barrier between the pipe and the water so that you break that connection between the two. And when that happens, then you don't have a pathway for the lead to corrode and come into the drinking water. So we have to build a better barrier is what we're after right now. So, so what, is, what is the lining of the pipes? What exactly is that that's gonna protect you from, like what's the coating? Sure, that coating, it, it, it's very scientific, but essentially to, to break it down to a very easy and digestible um, way of thinking of it is that when we introduce orthophosphate into the water that orthophosphate has a chemical reaction with the metal on the pipe and makes almost like a rust coating on the interior of the pipe that then builds a barrier through mineralization between the pipe and the water interface. So before I took this position as the supervisor for this unit I was the corrosion control specialist for the state. I'm working on trying to get somebody to do that job now, so it's not me doing two things. But um, yeah, we are gonna work very closely with the township on, <clears throat> on honing that down so that um, you folks don't have to worry about running through and changing out all your plumbing. We're gonna get that hazard mitigated as quickly as possible. But it does take a little time. It's not something that just happens overnight. It's gonna take us a little time to get the system in right. Cause you gotta dial it in slowly. If you try- Sure. Yeah. Sure. Every day for the last 15 years. I mean, I don't know what's going on. Absolutely. And that, that's well, a good point. Yeah, I'd like to talk, talk about that real quickly, if I might. Um, so my house was built in 1972, so I'm in the same, same case that everyone else, most people are. You know, a lot of people live in homes that are older than 1988. Um, and... Um, the, I like to talk about a lot when we um, are, are talking about new information about the things that we don't know. And back when they used lead, you know, a hundred years ago, they used to think it was a good idea to, for pregnant women to drink stout because they thought that it was full of minerals and it was going to be good for them. Um, you know. 70 years ago, they, you know, lead service lines were still widely used. Um, so as new information comes along, we learn more things that we used to do weren't safe for us or weren't healthy for us. But we're all here right now. We all grew up in those times and nothing really has changed there other than our understanding. And as we continue to understand and learn more things, we institute new practices. Village Acres Treatment Plant, uh, when we built that, we included corrosion control based on knowledge that um, these folks had in, from you know prior townships and, from, and what I had from prior townships. So the system is there, it's already working, and you know, like say we went through after that system was put in place, uh, two rounds of increased monitoring that didn't show um, any high results over the action level um, that would that would have triggered something like a public advisory. Those those rounds, you know, we as we continue to increase our knowledge of this, um, have 
reestablished these sampling pools that more represent, more closely represent, um, you know, where our populations are and where these older homes are. And so, you know, we're, we're continuing to kind of make our practices better. And I think that, you know, folks, I know a lot about lead and copper. I work, I've worked in water, uh, in drinking water for almost 20 years. And I know a lot about lead and copper. I will admit freely that I have never changed the aerator on my faucet. I have never flushed my service line before I make my coffee in the morning. Those, you know, are, and, and I understand because I'm exposed to all this information and training constantly about this. Um, you know, so I, I'm probably exposing myself and that's, that's kind of this continuing education that uh, you're going to be seeing a lot more from us. Um, I know health department has been really hammering this stuff for the last, you know, 10 years. And uh, uh, EGLE, used to be called MDEQ, State of Michigan has also been, been really pushing out a lot of this stuff because, you know, this regulation, we, we talked about the revised rule. You know, the lead and copper rule as a, as a response to new knowledge is, is continuously being revised. Yeah, just like all of our other rules that we that we follow, part of Public Act 399, Safe Drinking Water Act. So, you know, we're we're always continually trying to tighten this up to ultimately get to the goal of no lead. However, um, you know, we we can't go into every home, um, you know, and and pull out all the plumbing. Um, and replace it with something else. And so the, the solution here is corrosion control. And, you know, I'm, I'm very happy that we already have corrosion control. And I, like I said, I feel very confident that what we're really talking about here is a, is a minor adjustment in our dosage. And So, is that, what, is that why we got that new system like last summer? Is that what the problem is? Is the new system? What? The new system is there not was. Ooh, sorry, that's. Yeah. Not bad. <laughs> I just want to make sure I understand this. Yeah. So we were all on one system, and Correct. everything was fine, and we were testing fine. Then you guys, White Lake, decided to add a second system last year, and now. Since we've added a second system, we have bad tests. Something doesn't jive there. No, I'd like to answer that directly. Okay. So the iron filtration plant Village Acres that, that we constructed, went online in 2017, uh, was a response to, again, our number one water quality complaint in White Lake Township is rust. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't add a new system. There was an existing well house at Village Acres that did not have iron filtration. Um, had almost two parts per million of iron in that source drinking water. And we received literally hundreds of complaints every year and still continue to receive, you know, close to 100 complaints a year in the northern part of the township about that rust. Mm -hmm. So when you change the chemistry in water, um, and your, which we did when we're starting to remove minerals. Last year, correct? Corrosion control went in place. Last year? 2017. Okay. So right. we split this district for monitoring purposes into two districts uh, this year. Last year, because we put the new water plant online, part of the requirement of the law is to go for, onto increased monitoring for lead and copper control. We did two rounds of 40 samples, uh, two consecutive six month periods, and we did not have action level, action level exceedance during either of those two rounds. So now with this, uh, smaller districts, two separate districts, two separate rounds of sampling, and we've added a bunch of sample sites that, uh, that represent uh, a cross-section of, of the area. 
and, and we have three samples that have come back positive. Mm -hmm. We already have corrosion control in place, and that went in place with the plant. Um, you know, many other townships in the, there are a lot of groundwater systems in, in the state of Michigan that have these similar treatment processes. So these processes are not known to cause corrosion. Um, and we don't think that, that this process is causing corrosion. But, but like this gentleman said, yeah. when you introduce something to the system, like corrosion control, sure. all those kind of things, it's not something that happens quickly. It's something that takes time. Well, now we have a little time under our belt with the corrosion system, and now we're having issues. So it's, it's a little difficult to say exactly what's happening in this scenario, because what's going on here is that it's not a change in the system this year. The system is the same as it was last year. But what we did this year was we split in half and said, we're gonna call that up there system one, we're gonna call this down here system and two. And system one, majority of those people, district one, whatever you call it, sure. majority of those people have their own personal wells. Are no. they being tested? No, let me Everybody above M59 mostly is not on city water, they're on their own personal wells. I let me clarify that real quickly. Um, so what we have there and you have in your hand, I see you've got um, our public advisory. So this map, Mike, can you go back to the map? So this map. I'm sorry, guys. You're OK. Not We're here for questions yeah. and answers. Yeah. So. yeah, this is exactly right, yeah. So this map, generally the dark blue lines show um, where our water mains are. And then the orange and the kind of purpley blue area show our general coverage areas. Um, there are a lot of folks that are in these general coverage areas that do have private wells. Are and, those being tested too? Uh, folks can know this is testing the municipal system. That's okay. what we're this testing is about. the water that the, the know, piece that I'm trying that to get across control. here is that we took by splitting these into two pieces, we've done more straightforward analysis of each one. So, like he was explaining in the presentation earlier, if we still looked at this as one system. So no change in treatment, no change in the water quality. If we looked at this as one system as it had been looked previously, you would not have an action level exceedance right now. But because we split the system into half, we're getting a better view of treatment one and treatment two. And now we're saying, oh, look, there's maybe something going on in this corner that we didn't see before. So let's work on it a little better and adjust corrosion control to work more effectively. That's what's going on right right now. Okay. Yeah, so, so nothing has changed with our corrosion control dosage um, from last year to this year. Rand is exactly right. We're just looking in different places because we felt like, we again, we want to find this. We're looking for it specifically in homes that have lead solder. So we want to find these problems. Um, and, and that's why this is this has happened. So and you're a hundred percent for sure. Hundred, you could tell me today, a hundred percent for sure. The three samples that you took that tested positive do have those lead solders. You've checked. You know those houses have those lead solders. We know by the age of the home because of the copper plumbing there uh, that they have lead solder. Lead solder was all solder was made out of lead back then. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Right, right, right here. I want to apologize for using this platform, but over the last nine months, I became pretty, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, care about a lot of water, pure, uh, water quality. Um, just want everyone to let you know, um, there is a new technology that exists that does wipe out 99.5% uh, of contaminants out there, and there's so much more in your water than just lead. Uh, even if you're on well or city water, there's industrial runoff such as PFOS, which you may have heard in the Ann Arbor area, and chromium hexavalent industrial runoffs. Um, so I work for Hans Premium Water. Uh, again, sorry to use this platform, but again, as I'm passionate about water purification, and I don't want to use it, I just want you guys to know that there is more, rather than waiting for your government to find a solution for your water purification. Sir, sir, I appreciate taking the opportunity to get plug in here. 
But, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of folks in the audience here that have some questions. I see this gentleman behind you here is standing up. There's another one behind him there that has been waiting for quite a while. So, you know, you're welcome to hand out business cards or, or anything like that. But, you know, we're really not um, sitting here right now to advertise um, My apologies. in home water treatment processes. Um, you're, you're more than welcome to. Uh, you know, conduct that business here at the end, but we really want to give these folks an opportunity to get their questions answered. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm from the state, yeah. Well, it's, it's a difficult question. And, and the reason why it's difficult is because not all brass is the same. Some brass was made with more lead content than others. So to really know what your exposure might be from each faucet, then yes, you would need to test each one individually to know how much is this one versus another. Yeah, and there's, there's ways to do that with uh, small volume bottles so that you can get just what's in the faucet and see what's going on from that faucet specifically if you're worried one, about what one. that one is. Um, I don't think no? we've talked about PVC. I'm going to bring this over to you because I think other people can't hear your question. Go ahead. But so there's no testing uh, anticipated for PVC? I, I don't have well, the answer we, to that at this we time. We do test the water supply for volatile organic compounds, um, but that's typically not within homes. But that would be the only thing that I, I guess you could get from a PVC line, maybe. Um, if you're concerned about that, there are ways to have your water tested for that as well. But it's not something that we've found to be a problem in drinking water supplies across the state. We haven't, we haven't found VOCs coming into water from PVC. In my house, Everything is through a water softener. And looking at the instructions, it wants you to take a sample outside the, wa the water softener. That's not possible in my home. Uh, yeah, my bypass, if I shut it off, I don't get any water in the house. That's not a bypass. That's not a bypass. <laughs> that's a, that's a shut exactly. Off. <laughs> yeah. It shuts off the water. You're right. Um, yeah. So, so your home, um, you know, may not because you can't bypass that. Then, is part of the requirement under the state's um, normal corrosion control testing that we they do under the monitoring schedule. You know, um, we would want to look at if you were interested in participating. Um, you know, we could certainly talk to your plumber about how to get that bypass in there or, you know, otherwise that, you know, I would recommend uh, working with the health department to, um, you know, get some additional sampling methods. Not all hose spigots are, so are unsoftened. Some places they put the softener in before any of the rest of the water that leaves the house in any spot. Um, so, so the answer is maybe it depends on the home. Yeah, and again, testing under um, under our routine monitoring and, and our monitoring schedule that we're looking for people to sign up. Those those tests are required to come from your main kitchen sink or your main bathroom sink. Yeah, a lot of fixtures that are used for that type of purpose aren't to drinking water standards, and you'll see drastically different levels because of that. Now. Um, one thing that I do want to give you as a piece of information, we have different flushing times in the rec recommendations between um, people with a lead service line versus people without a lead service line. Um, to flush specifically for a fixture issue, if you think about it, the fixture itself is only a small volume with uh, the length of plumbing that's attached to it. 
to flush that out is a very short length of time to then get water past that fixture that may be brass, that may have higher lead levels, and get the water that's not in contact with those materials, you would be in that 30 seconds to two minutes. And generally, when people are getting a drink of water from their kitchen or their bathroom, they're letting it run until it's cold anyway. So you may already be doing some of those activities to that's lower those point. lead levels and lower your exposure. With reverse osmosis, which we have, does that need to be flushed also for that minute or two? Do you have reverse osmosis just at your like kitchen sink? Uh, at yeah. the kitchen so sink the and the refrigerator. Sure, so your reverse osmosis system, you don't have to worry about that as long as it was installed correctly. Because that usually goes to an individual tap by itself, right? It's not part of the, the faucet. It has its own little faucet. And that's designed to be um, plastic mainly in nature so that you don't have corrosion because um, RO units actually make the water very corrosive and if it was in contact with metal it would take up that metal but what Jenny's alluding to is is absolutely perfect that you have to remember that it takes time it's not just if the water touches metal it picks it up it has to be in contact with the metal for an extended period of time to dissolve the metal into the water and then go so if you flush the water that's been sitting there for quite a while out and then take a drink, you're taking a drink of water that hasn't had time to pick up metal. It's less likely to have lead or copper or anything else in it. Right. Or taking a shower, you're, you're letting the water get hot first. You're inadvertently flushing that, um, that water that's the most concentrated, that's in contact with that fixture at that point in time. Although you might want to start brushing your teeth at the sink instead. Great questions. Yeah, that's you should never you should never brush your teeth with warm water. You should never cook. You should never prepare food. Do anything with hot water out of your tap, regardless of where you're, whether you're on a well or on township yeah. water. The basic, the basic idea is it deals with chemistry, that heat increases chemical reactions and that time increases chemical reactions, that when you're talking about these metals getting into the water, those are the things that you're looking at that's going to increase those metals getting into that water is time and heat. The short. And I, I, go ahead. I completely respect your question. I will answer it, but he's been waiting a really long time. <laughs> so if you don't mind, can we hear what he's got to say? And my question's really I'll come short. Back to you. What are the impacts in our home of water softeners and whole house filters on those orthophosphates? Are we inadvertently removing all of the stuff that you're putting in to try and help us with our so lead So a problem? softener doesn't usually remove phosphate. The charge on phosphate is not such that a typical um, anion exchange softener like you would have in your, or a cat, excuse me, cation exchange softener that you have in your home will remove phosphate. So the phosphate should break through the softener and be in your home plumbing. The problem though is that when you have a softener, you are removing the maximum amount of calcium that you can, and that can force water to be more corrosive. So it may make it so that there is not enough phosphate to be in that water column to stave off all the corrosion. And then follow up, because we're in that distribution too, you're now removing all the iron and everything which kind of means we might not even need the softener anymore. Is that fairly correct? If you're using the softener for iron removal, that would be correct. No. Thank you. The, the iron filtration plant at Village Acres does remove iron. It does not remove calcium carbonate, which is generally where that, that hardness. Um, so you'll still have, um, you know, if you, if you didn't have a softener or folks that don't have a softener may see those white water spots on their dishes, 
There are a lot of products out there that um, people use to, to get away from that. Uh, I don't have a water softener in my house. I'm on Waterford Township Water. Um, they have plants that are designed very similar to the design of ours, and they are also a groundwater system. Um, you know, so if we don't use the certain types of soap and things like that, you know, we'll get some hard water in there. But, um, you know, it was a, a decision that we made as a family that we didn't want to have that sodium, you know, concentration. And, uh, you know, so that's, a, that's kind of a personal choice there. Can we answer this question over here? Thank you. Mike. Yeah, so I, I think the reason that you have not typically been hearing like, oh, you shouldn't use hot water for things like cons consumption purposes, right? Um, I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that we've had, and, and I'm, I'm hoping to be backed up by state health or local health here because I'm not a health expert, but um, there's been bigger fish to fry, essentially. There's more places where there's lead exposure than water. So I think in the past, people have worried more about things like soil and paint in other areas where you get a lot more exposure to lead than drinking water. But now as we're ratcheting things down and we're trying to make our population's exposure to lead across the board less, we're finding all the avenues for lead and we're trying to educate. I just don't understand why it should just be public knowledge. Ever since I was growing up, I just never heard use cold water. So why now? I think it just used to use be more water? public knowledge than it is now. Because I remember my grandmother telling me, don't ever cook with hot water. She didn't know why, but she knew you don't do it. Never and heard I think that. we've just lost it over time, and now it's coming back. I mean, yep. oil water, is it? removing what is it removing yes when you, when you when you heat water what it does is it drops all the minerals out of the water okay when you when you go through a water heater and you've got the big tank there and you're heating the bottom of it you're taking the calcium carbonate and such which stabilizes the water and you're precipitating it out in the bottom of your water heater so if you've ever drained a water heater you get all this gunk out of the bottom of the water heater right well that's all the minerals that were in your water helping it from to be less corrosive then on top of that adding energy like in the form of heat to the water that now is a little more corrosive makes it even more corrosive and that's why you don't want to be drinking that because as it sits in those pipes it's really picking up the material in those pipes i think i'm i'm ruined <laughs> Sorry. I, know. I know it's sometimes it's better to be like this <laughs> so let's talk about that real quick just real just one quick second um so public education about lead like I said, um, it's been out there for a long time. I mean, we all know that lead paint is bad. Is that public education that, you know, finally over the years has kind of gotten through to us? And really lead and drinking water is something that has been uh, talked about a lot since, um, you know, basically since the city of Flint. That education materials, um, that ed public education and, and those materials have been available for quite a while, but you're right. It's not something that, you know, I don't know if my doctor has ever said anything about don't drink uh, water. I, I think I heard that from my grandmother, um, you know. Now, when you, you know, we get a new water heater and it takes four guys to get your old one out of the basement. You know, that weight that's in there is all that, calcium carbonate that has precipitated out of that thing in the four or five years that it lasted. Um, all that mineral in there balances out that chemistry in that water. So, um, you know, maybe out of all of these that come up, you know, there's going to be a lot more of these communities that, that get flagged under this uh, as these restrictions, uh, as these regulations get tighter and tighter. Um, I think that that'll be a good opportunity for us to get this information out there more. Okay, I'm going to hand here. this over. Hi, I have two questions. The first one, our home was built in 1995, so if I'm understanding you correctly, are you saying we don't need to worry about this? What we're saying about a home that was built in 1995 is that copper is likely to not have any lead solder in it. Okay, but you still may have some issues around faucets. 
But the nice part about faucets is like Jenny was saying, they contain very little water in them. So if you just turn the faucet on and allow it to run for just a little bit of time, any lead that was accumulated in that faucet gets flushed out. Okay, and then my second question is, <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed to ask it, but Don't. we eat out a lot. What about the commercial buildings in White Lake? Is there any safeguards in place? So, you know, if my kid gets a Coke from McDonald's or so at a restaurant. Good, yeah, the great news about restaurants is the majority of time they want to have very consistent water quality. So they usually have filtration systems and such in place already on a lot of those soda machines and, and such. So the majority of the restaurants in town are, are connected to the township water, you know, and, and again, they'll also have that corrosion control orthophosphate treatment. Um, so bathroom sinks and all those kind of areas in the, in the restaurant that aren't treated are still being treated by the township water source. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, similar to the notice that you've received um, telling you about lead and some ways to mitigate your exposure, um, MDARD, uh, Michigan Department of Agriculture, Agricultural and Rural Development, or Rural Development and Agriculture. Uh, something like that. Don't work for them, have to, don't have to remember their acronym completely. Um, they also prepared a notice to all of the businesses um, with similar flushing recommendations so that they're flushing their ice machines, they're doing all of those things similarly to how you've been also given recommendations to reduce your exposure. And they, they have been working through Oakland County Health Division on um, facilitating getting that information out to all those folks. Okay, this gentleman has a question. Thank you. Oh, I. Here we go. One back here, sir. If I may, I'd like to put this hot water tank issue to bed. I have been on 60 Minutes, Good Morning America, and Prime Time, all on the subject of hot water tanks. Some of you will recognize my voice. My name is Joe Gannon. I've been the appliance doctor on radio for the last 36 years. I discovered in my home on our four-year-old hot water heater that the faucet aerators were plugging up and I discovered there's a defective component in the hot water tank. There was a lawsuit instituted by Switzer or whatever his name is in New York, thanks to Jennifer Granholm, which resulted in a $5 billion lawsuit against the five or six at the time hot water manufacturers. Now the young lady over here who mentioned that she brushes her teeth with hot water, let me just give you one reason, actual experience. My hot water tank's four years old. I had the, my plumber come over. I said to the plumber, who's been a plumber for 25 years, you ever see the inside of a used tank four years old? He says, no. I says, let's go get a saw. Let's cut a hole in there. We can put our ears and our head in there and see what's inside. And they're correct when they tell you it's loaded with minerals. This high, four years old, loaded with solid material. But most important, my wife, who was a retired school principal at the time was schooling, I filled a plastic bag with the water that came out of there. And Jennifer, her, Jennifer Granholm herself, load that up, bring it to the state capitol, we were gonna have all the TV people there. And she put her hands in there. And I said, you can put a glove on or something. No, I, I raised some kids, I know what it is. To, anyways, she pulled out this snot material that was hanging like a rag, and it was so bad, it could you make you vomit just looking at it. That's what the young lady is using to brush her teeth. <laughs> I ran on the side of a dentist. So, but You're killing her. Anyways, You're, that's a nice You're killing this lady, sir. <laughs> this water can't sleep in right now. Tank <laughs> will hurt you. Guaranteed to hurt you. Do not use it for anything except washing your hands or whatever or taking a shower. If you could see what I showed on television, prime time, good morning America, 60 minutes, they all had their cameras there at my house. And this is what I was showing them 
was in there. Anyways, it was a national story, folks. So please take their advice and stop using that stuff to brush your teeth here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes uh, you mentioned when you were first starting talking about all of this that you're not sure if it's the soldering that is the problem. And I don't believe it is the soldering because if it was, we'd be talking about a lot of communities and from 1988 and before 1988, prior to 19... So, why is White Lake in Birmingham and Hazel Park being singled out? Yeah, it's, it's not a singling out, it's test results. So when we do the testing and we look and see what we get back, that's what drives it. So Birmingham and Hazel Park, those two are not in the same spot as White Lake. Those ones have lead service lines and they were sampling at lead service lines. And those two communities specifically we were identified as having an issue because of the new, um, more, more proactive sampling approach that we have at the state. So we're doing for lead service lines, they have to do a, fifth, a first draw and a fifth liter sample. It's kind of complicated, but um, we're looking at data we'd never looked at before. So if you looked at the, the data as we would have looked at it previously, neither one of those two communities you mentioned would have had an issue either. But now that we're looking at this fifth liter sample that we're playing with, we're seeing an issue. So it's kind of similar to this in the situation that as we look closer, as we look deeper and we get more information, it kind of feeds back to us like, oh, maybe there's something going on here. Let's investigate. Let's take more samples. I believe you need to. I have going. a house that's 1991. I, I went to the health services yesterday to get, I have a two year old at home and I'm concerned. I've been in yeah. the house for 16 years, never had a problem. Sure. But if it was code, okay, a plumber's code from 88 prior, okay, you should be testing Waterford, you should be testing all these communities from 88 on. In, if it was we cold. are we are so and what that's we're looking why I just I, I that's where I'm having a hard time with this this meeting when I'm hearing this sure because you're saying you think it's this but you didn't come out and say it is this it's not you're you're not saying 100% sure that this is from the lead solder so what else could it be what is it something this gentleman talked about what else could it be? I live in Village Acres, 2017 this started, okay? And we didn't have a problem until now. How come the North End doesn't have a problem? Why is it only the South End? So give me some, some answers that I feel comfortable with. So, yeah, I'd like to answer that. <clears throat> so we did talk about um, where the lead in our system comes from and, and we do know and I want to make that very clear that we do know the most common source of lead in our water system in the township is lead solder and that's commonly found in homes older than 1988 and again that's why we specifically sample for homes that are older than 1988 um, and, and as Brandon stated last year under the regulation that was in place last year, these same sample results would not have been a violate or not a violation, would not have been an action level exceedance. This year, because we are looking at this in a different way, um, and we split these sample pools up so that we could reevaluate the number of residents that we serve and find more homes that are, you know, we're cross section representation of our system, uh, we did find these three. Now these same three uh, high results in previous years would not have been uh, any kind of an exceedance. Nothing has changed there from last year to this year other than where we're looking and, and the way we've split the distribution system up. So that's kind of an important distinction. Nothing's changed with the water, nothing's changed with the plumbing, Nothing's changed with 
um, our corrosion control dosage from last year to this year. The only thing that has changed is a line on the map and calling this two systems rather than one system so that we could look more closely at each one of these systems, it, you know, and we, when we did this, we reevaluated the number of residents that was in each area. The problem with the north half of the township is that the, the mass majority of that uh, that's on our water system is commercial properties. And they don't really fit the criteria uh, for what we're looking for under this, uh, you know, under this monitoring. So, you know, we determined that we are supplying roughly 2,000 homes, um, you know, roughly 2,000 residents in the north part of the township, but we're supplying almost 4,000 residents in, in the southern part of the township. So it made sense to increase the number of samples that we're, we're looking at in the south. And because they have different treatment processes, it made sense to look at them separately rather than one so that we can find these issues and, because we are looking for these issues. That, that's really the crux of it. We're looking for these issues. We're looking at um, getting out into those corners of the system that may not have been tested before or, um, you know, maybe uh, haven't been tested at all because we're calling it all one and all of our samples are in another place. So the second part of your question was, um, you know, talking about um, why haven't we, you know, mentioned this before. Right now, all we know is that we have three samples that came back over the action level. Because the way we've d divided this up um, and we're treating each one of these districts as its own thing, now we're calling this an action level before it might not have been. And now that we're calling it an action level, that's basically a big caution flag that goes up for us that says, hey, we need to take a deeper look at this. Now, when we put out this public advisory, this is a precautionary measure to let folks know that we have found this issue and what we're doing about it. Um, this is a requirement under the law, but you know we worked very hard to get this out to everybody as fast as possible because we feel like this is the right thing to do because as the, um, the lady in the back had talked about, you know, the public education is, you know, let's, let's face it, it's kind of lagging behind the knowledge. And so our hope is to get this information out there. These, things, these are things that people can do, whether they're on the township water system or not, to minimize their exposure to this plumbing. And until we get through our retesting, we won't know if we need to turn our phosphate dosage up or not. And, and really, that's where we're at right now. We, we need to get through this retesting and, then, and, and, and find out if our dosage is optimized or you know, if these samples were errors or, or what. We, we don't know that until we get this retesting done. Yeah, so the, the test that the health department is going to give you is a, is a small jar that's about, uh, you know, 100 milliliters or so, 100 or 200 milliliters. The, big, the biggest piece of the difference is that the, the samples that he is asking or the township is asking you to take are compliance samples. To be a compliance sample, you have to bypass the softener. 
if you're the local health department looking at what are you specifically consuming on a normal day with your softener, they want the softener in place. So they're, they're kind of two different things. And it's actually two different samples. So we're looking for a one liter sample. Um, it's a completely different testing code from the state. And that sample is called lead and copper for corrosion control. Um, the sample that you're getting from the health department or the state um, may just be for lead, and that's a much smaller bottle with different collection technique. Yep. The gentleman in uh, green here has been standing quite a while. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a couple of uh, quick questions. The three samples of the three homes that came back over the action levels, are there any other potential lines of evidence that you're looking at? I mean, do you know where they are located other than in distribution area two? I mean, are they located close together, dispersed throughout it? Do you know where they're at? We do know where they're at. Are they in a, you know, quote unquote cluster or are they at the far reaches of the distribution area? They're kind of spread out a little bit. Okay. Um, two, I would say, are fairly close together, but one is one is off the, the other two. So, I mean, if you were shooting, it wouldn't be a very good group. Okay. And are there, I mean, you, I'm not asking for it, but you obviously know a little more specifics about the actual homes on when they were built and that type of thing. Are they, is there similarities there? Or are they at the older end of the spectrum, the newer end of the spectrum? Um, you know, I don't have that information right in front of me right here. Um, they are all older than 1988, yeah. and that's really what we're looking for. Okay, thank you. Yep. One other thing that will be happening with those three homes, if the homeowners want to, is that DHHS, anytime we get an elevated result for compliance sampling, they follow up with that homeowner and they don't just look at one bottle and one piece of information. They take multiple bottles and test each one of them to get a different number from each section of plumbing throughout the house. So when you're asking questions about is it coming from the faucet, is it coming from the lead solder, um, could it potentially be a service a lead service line in a different community? You're going to see those numbers and those different trends in those multiple bottles. And DHHS does that with every single home that has an elevated level. So those three homes, they'll be trying to contact them and see if the homeowner wants to participate in that sampling. So far, we have had one homeowner uh, express some interest in participating, and um, we're, we're still working on trying to get the other two. Um. Yep. I'm sorry, it took so long to get to your question. You're not. I uh, just got a few points. I'll try and keep it short here. Uh, Matt and Jim uh, over there. I appreciate you guys coming. Um, the uh, I live in the big uh, mega sub. My name is Ed Wins, and um, I do have a background in this. I'm also a lead inspector, risk assessor. I teach it for the state and the EPA and I'm the biggest lead abatement contractor in the state. Uh, we spent three years in Flint fixing the Flint problem for the Fannie Mae Freddie Mac, so we kind of know what it takes to do it. Um, I, I, I hate to see that everybody's panicked about this because it's, I'm glad you're testing more. It should have been more testing prior to this, but <clears throat> the flushing is the easiest thing that you said. You, you, every time you turn on the water, you're gonna be flushing a lot of it out anyways. I gotta watch what I say, I'll spend all more time than you guys have had. Um, there's lead in the solder still out today. I can go buy it at Home Depot, so it's a lot easier to solder with lead in the solder than it is silver solder. Um, there's a lot of areas that have it. If you buy a crappy faucet, Glacier Bay is one. We took it apart and had it sampled at the lab, and we had found 40% more solder in a Glacier Bay than a Delta faucet. So when you buy junk, you get junk. Um, you're gonna find it. But the corrosion control they put in the phosphates help coat the system, so it's not gonna leach into your water. Uh, it shouldn't be that big of a deal that you should be concerned at this time. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't drink hot water. Um, but, uh, you know, there's also, as a, as, a, as a builder and a building inspector, I'm, you should be flushing your hot water tanks, and I know nobody does that. Um, just be thankful that they're testing more. I'd love to talk with you guys on more on this stuff, but uh, the biggest point you're gonna find lead is in the paint 
in the soil. They're not going to find it in the water. Um, this has been around for years. And the reason the lead lines were used, the biggest reason why is World War II, the 10, 15 year period is because lead was easier to get than any of the other metals. So that's why it was used when it was done. Um, trying to think what else. There's too many other things to list out. but. Just getting your house tested is the way to go. If you want to get it tested, you can have this, the state come in, and I'm sure you guys will be testing a lot more. It's very simple to do. I do think, Aaron, that the wrong thing to do is to have the homeowners do the sample. But you know, I, 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 I realize manpower is a whole nother yeah. story, and that's where the whole thing comes in. But there's a you know, maybe a little training video on how to do it because they'll mess it up and let some of it pour out before they take the right amount. And, yeah. You know. So we we actually go and appreciate your time, um, guys. Thank you. We actually go and coach homeowners on on how to do that. There's an instruction that comes from the state that goes with the the sample. Um, so you know, my staff will go out and coach them through the instructions. On, on how to follow it, how to fill out the affidavit that goes with it. The homeowner is required to record when they last used the water, when they took the sample, if they bypassed their softener, uh, you know, if they uh, have done all of that, they will sign the sample. You know, we do have, um, you know, White Lake. We do have uh, a very high intelligentsia among our population in White Lake Township, and you know, again, our sample, our sampling procedures, I don't feel like is the issue here. Uh, these same set of samples, if we were talking about this as as one system, would not be an action level exceedance. So I think that's really what the issue is there. Now in Waterford Township, I worked at Waterford Township for close to 16 years in drinking water treatment. Um, you know, they also have their residents um, take the sample and they, they coach those folks through that. Now, um, in addition to that, you know, we have done more sampling in the past. As I stated, we, we did 80 samples last year and we had only two that came back higher than the action level. So when we get one of those, um, you know, we start working with those folks individually and um, one of those folks did uh, participate in resampling and, and their resample came back non-detect. <laughs> so their first sample they took at a kitchen sink, their second sample, which came back over the action level, their second sample they took out of their main bathroom sink, which came back as non-detect. So that kind of goes to what Ed is talking about with the, you know, with the quality of a, a fixture that you buy. There's there's a lot of stuff out there and there may be a lot of old stock out there and I don't know what what all those regulations are, but. If I could, Aaron, real quick. Yeah. The, the township had a neighbor in the sub over from me do their own sampling and they didn't take it from where you recommended. They took it from a boiler valve just after the meter and that boiler valve had been sitting in there for since the builder put it in and it was non-potable. So it came back at 3,700. That sample got thrown out by the city. It got sent to the county. The county told the homeowner, you need to fix that. So yep. I had them cut it off and everything tested fine. But it, again, it's just a matter of- I know exactly they, where that home okay. was that you're referring to. Yeah, I know. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, so it kind of goes to show that there, you know, there's, there's a huge variety of household brass out there. Um, and that, you know, generally speaking, you're going to want to try to get the nicest possible um, equipment in your home that you can that you can afford. I've got a question up here. This gal's been waiting a while. Yep. Not a question. Thank you. My name is Sue Menenti. I'm with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And thank you all for coming. Just wanted to take the opportunity to restate our recommendations just as a reminder. We are recommending that you use cold filtered water for making baby formula, for cooking, for rinsing your fruits and vegetables. Think of it, um, anytime you're gonna swallow water, that would be the main way that um, lead could harm you. And again, the main um, source of lead is lead paint, lead dust, uh, uh, not typically um, water as a main source. 
And those that are most likely to be harmed by lead are children uh, and women who are pregnant because of the fetus. Wouldn't be me, I'm well beyond that age, but it is, um, it is going to be the children and the pregnant women. So again, cold filtered water for making baby formula, cooking, rinsing fruits and vegetables, brushing teeth. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to uh, give you that bit of a reminder. We are here, we can answer questions after. Oakland County Health Department is here as well, and we're happy to talk to you. Yeah, Thank you. Sue and the rest of DHHS have a website um, that has all of that information on it. It's michigan.gov backslash MI for the state of Michigan, lead safe. And it has all the different sources of lead. Um, if you're more interested in drinking water, it goes through all those things. And then if you're also interested in paint, dust, or soil, it has information for those sources as well. Uh, good evening, everyone. I uh, just want to thank White Lake Township for the public service announcement. There's a couple things that I would uh, like to address, a few questions, comments, and concerns. Um, first and foremost, um, after the Flint water crisis, I received um, a notice in my mail for, I'm not sure when it was, it probably was 2016 from a test from 2014, which was kind of a little bit odd to me. But again, I just want to thank you guys for making it public and being willing to test. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, like I am, are there any places that you tested that were past the 1988 date that had any trace amounts of the lead? And also, um, as far as the action level, uh, anything under that, is that threatening? And I just want to let you answer those questions before I go any further. Yeah, so we specifically, um, our sample pool for compliance purposes, we're required to sample those homes that are um, 1988 or older if we, if we can get participation. That is the key. Um, in the past, we have had rounds where we're not able to get enough of those homes. So then we would move into that other category, um, and those would be homes newer than 1988. We still try to specifically target homes where we're going to find our most, our highest likelihood of, of finding lead, um, because we're specifically looking to make sure that our corrosion control is being is effective. Um, now, as far as uh, receiving notifications, you know, two years late. We could talk about a little bit about what we're going to be doing the next. Next, um, so we did this public advisory uh, right away to get the information out to everybody that may feel like they're, um, you know, to to basically educate everybody so that people could take any nece necessary precautions if they feel like they're in those at-risk populations until we can uh, get all of our resampling completed you know in these next two rounds now going down the road what you'll start to see from us is periodic um, public education information that's going to be coming out we'll be mailing some of this out we'll be posting it on our township website you'll see it pop up on our facebook page uh, we're working on one now um, with the state to make sure that you know everything that's in there is factual and that's going to be for compliance purposes but then down the road, um, the folks at DHHS or uh, EPA or EGLE or um, Oakland County Health Division have a massive amount of public education material that's out there and that's available. And, you know, we've had some of that on our website uh, in the past. And, you know, I think it's been up there for, you know, it's at least as long as I've been here. Uh, in the future, you know, we're just going to continue to keep kind of getting this out there because, like I said, it all depends on the age of the house, when you may come, to, come in contact with lead. You could come in contact with lead from lead paint. Um, you know, recently in the news we've heard about Chinese toy manufacturers that still are using lead paint and that, that stuff is getting found out and, and exposed. So 
we want to continue to educate our public on what where this lead is and everything that they can do to minimize their exposure in every way and so when you see this you know um, I, I, unfortunately, I feel like for some folks that's going to cause um, a little bit of a panic and, you know, we might get a few conspiracy theorists out there that, um, you know, that pop up. But, but really what we're trying to do is continue that education. So continuous education on this, I, I think, is going to be the only way that we can uh, go forward. And, you know, as I stated before, we're very lucky. We have, a, you know, a very intelligent um, demographic here. Um, we have, you know, I think Rick stated recently that we have uh, more folks over a certain age and that was 55 than, than we had under a certain age and, you know, so the, these people that live in White Lake Township, or you folks that live in White Lake Township, are, um, you know, it's, let's face it, it's a high-end community and uh, so I think that it's going to be well received by everybody and I think that it's going to be fairly easy to understand and um, you know some of these other agencies that I mentioned you know I have been working very hard on on making these publications understandable over the years because so we're, we're talking about a lot of technical stuff but at the end of the day not a lot of that matters if you can you know do some of that easy stuff that they described and, and minimize your exposure. Yes, and I think we all appreciate those uh, tips about that. Um, I directly would like to address my concern for, is there any sort of sampling coming back from places that don't come prior to 1988? That's more or less what I'm trying to find out. Like, I understand that that's typically not what you're looking for, yeah. but, you know, for us of those who don't have homes older than that that is a cause for concern so that's specifically what i'm trying to be educated on right at this moment sure and and uh so you know we do test our, our drinking water wells one of those tests does include lead um other than that we we are primarily focusing on those older homes um as a resident I would recommend contacting Oakland County Health Department. Um, they have uh, a laboratory there that is certified to test lead, and they are uh, very reasonably priced. And they also have uh, the expertise in-house there to to talk to you about how to collect the samples and where you're going to collect the samples that you know that would give you a a very good idea of what you're dealing with in your own home. Yeah. All right. So we'll directly answer your question. Yes. You are likely to not have leaded solder if you're built after the 88 period, but yep. you may, mm -hmm. likely not. And if that's the case, then your source of lead goes down, right? So as it's going down, your risk is going down. What you have left then is fixtures that could have brass or could mm -hmm. have other lead containing components. So that's your other potential source. So. Um, we haven't tested all those homes to make sure because we're looking at highest risk. So if we look at the highest risk and they don't have alarming levels of lead across them, that starts giving you more confidence that the lower level, the lower risk homes are okay. So that's kind of why we look at that highest risk and then we move towards the lowest risk so that we identify it as fast as possible. Now your other question, if you feel like that one was answered, your other well, and he kind of gave you that if you want to know your home, get it tested. Okay. Then your other question was, is, there, is it safe if it's under 15? 15 is an action level. So what that means is if it's over 15, we need to take action. Because what we're trying to do over time is minimize the amount of exposure to lead. So, you know, back and public health could do a lot better job of this than I'm sure I can. But back in time, my grandfather, his levels of lead exposure were much higher than my father's, who are now much, or yeah, were much higher than my father's, and his was much higher than mine, and my, mine is much higher than my children, right? We're trying to get closer and closer and closer to no lead exposure, because there's no safe level of lead. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And. Um it was mentioned before that um, a couple of these uh, sites that were sampled were fairly close to each other. Um, it, 
I'm not sure about the legalities of it, but is there any way that you could disclose so we can kind of pinpoint what areas might actually be more at risk for these types of samples? So that way, we the the knowledge that you've expressed tonight and within the, the newsletter, people will actually uh, pay more attention and actually take those considerations. Um, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, with three samples, the issue that really becomes we don't have a broad enough sampling pool. So you know, we're not going to release the location of those, those three samples. They are fairly random, and I can say um, the two that were close together, we had um, probably eight or ten, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, additional homes in that neighborhood that had uh, no detection or very low levels of detection. So for, for privacy purposes, and because we do, um, you know, we do ask residents to take these samples. Um, you know, we're we're not going to release the locations or the, the names of those folks. We are going to continue to resample, uh, and we will. You know, like I say, we we were at a higher sampling level last year. We didn't have any detections. We went down to a lower sampling level this year with some some slight differences. Now, ne next year, starting in January 1st, we'll go back to a higher level sampling. Now, the difference is between last year and this year, where rather than doing 40 samples for the entire system, we'll do 40 samples now just in District 2 to try to identify if there are any correlations on where these samples are located uh, and uh, what levels we detect there. Yes, and I'd like to commend the Department of Public Works for separating the system so we can kind of get a better understanding and more control of that. So thank you, folks. Um, among those homes that were uh, testing above the, the at-risk level, were they or were they not um, prior to 1988? I think we just kind of want to know uh, in general, just so yep. you know. All three of those. Yeah, all three of those homes were uh, older than 1988. Okay, excellent. I think that's all I have for now. Thank you, guys. I have a Thank gentleman you. over here who has, questions. A, has a question over here. Yeah, actually, uh, the question I have is the three homes that were over the uh, 15 parts per billion. Yes. Had any of those three homes been tested previously in other years? Uh, no, they were all new sampling sites that we found this, this year. Okay, and the, the second question I have, uh, you mentioned that the previous year sampling, you found two homes that were above the 15 parts per billion. Yes. What district were those in? Were those in District 1 or District 2? Uh, one of those I know for sure was in District 2. Um, I don't have the paperwork in front of me here on the other one. So uh, if you want to call me tomorrow at the office, I can, I can get to that number. Now, Thank the you. one that was in District 2 last year uh, was in our summer round of sampling. And we had the higher than... Uh, action level result, and that was the one home that uh, took us up on on resampling. So we um, took the resample and out of because we're allowed to take it out of either the main kitchen sink or the the main bathroom. Uh, she was interested in going with the other faucet just to kind of see if they did come back as a difference if it was a faucet issue. And you know that that second sample came back as non-detect. So you know we kind of think we ruled that one down to the faucet. But uh, she is still continuing to participate in in later rounds. She did also participate in this round, I believe. Okay, I have a lady with a question. Yes, thank you. Hi, I have a little different perspective. I'm representing a church and a school that's in the. District 2, or Distribution 2. Um, so we're doing all the necessary precautions and erring on the side of caution and whatnot. So in the interim between getting the water tested and getting the results, what is the recommendation? Um, the recommendation would be to follow all of the recommendations in the public advisory, which I, I think I've directly been in contact with, with uh, you or with yeah. uh, the principal at the school. Um, you know, I would certainly uh, suggest if you're, 
if you're interested to um, contact Oakland County Health Department yeah. and, and maybe and scheduling some testing there. there. Yeah. Uh, like I say, they're very, very affordable. Um, in the meantime, you know, like following these these items identified in the public advisory will reduce your exposure exponentially. So, okay. you know, simply um, when so you get, the there, food prep, just when you the get there in the morning, run the water, yeah. you know, run the drinking fountains for a couple minutes. Um, you know, I know that Dublin School is recently, um, you know, when I contacted Dublin School, they've recently put in uh, some brand new uh, water Yeah, we have those fountains. on the school side. Yep. And, um, you know, they've, they've and those do take it. out the this yeah. issue? There's do, yes. So the water filter should be fine on the school side. Yep. And that NSF okay. ANZ standard 53 is the thing you want to look for on your filter cartridges. Okay. Oh. Cert certified to reduce lead. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you if you can stick around until I'm done with here, if you guys are interested in sampling, let me give you a business card. I have a, a community drinking water school specialist that can talk with you. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. And I guess I would highly recommend um, flushing, especially for like a nursery or a daycare, flushing those taps before they're used. Um, or just being kind of aware of that, that if you've got intermittent use in one of your buildings, if you represent a facility, or in your home, that flushing after an extended period of not using the water um, will get rid of that stagnant water, that water that is more likely to contain those metals um, and will reduce your exposure. Okay, we have another question. Hi, I live in uh, Village Acres, and when we moved in three and a half years ago, we were told we were part of a community well. Um, is that A, possible and accurate information, and B, is this the same system that we're referring to? Uh, yeah, so community well is a term that uh, used to be used back in the 60s, mainly, um, that described uh, a neighborhood yeah. well house. <laughs> and so um, those neighborhood well houses over the years had been uh, adopted by the township and, and operation and maintenance of that has been transferred to the township and then over time all of those community well systems have kind of been interconnected and, and that essentially is how uh, the system that you see up there today is grown um, so yeah originally that was five or six community wells and um, you know as the the township kind of gets developed, uh, you know, that that system continues to connect and extend. Perfect, thank you. And my other question, and I don't know if anybody's able to answer this, but when you see a sampling that's above the level in one home and then perhaps next door that was built the same time, that was probably built by the same builder, et cetera, et cetera, what are we thinking may be the cause for one home versus another having the issues? Well, personal use inside of a home can, can vary greatly. Um, there are in-home treatment devices that, you know, some people have and some people don't, and there's a vast variety of different devices out there. So, you know, we can't really make any speculation based on those results. I know um, we did have, you know, like I said, many other homes in the area of some of these samples where we had non-detect. Um, it could mean that there were errors in the sample collection. It could mean that, you know, something that is in that in-home environment is, is affecting that sample result. Um, you know, we, we don't really know those things yet. We'll, we'll have more understanding on that as we get this next round of, of increased monitoring. I guess I, I would point out that not all of the homes had elevated levels. Not all of the, some of the homes were zero. Um, all of the homes were supposed to be targeted for lead containing components, um, and in this case, the lead, the leaded solder. Um, that water usage within the home is very variable, and so, uh, like Aaron said, you, you can't make correlations between one house and another. Um, and the best thing to do is to get your water tested if you're interested in knowing what your water in your home is like. Any other questions? Water filter that's NF, NSF 53, are there any specs for that, like micron, charcoal filter? 
No, the, the NSF certification, that means that that filter has been challenged through testing and has performed appropriately. So what I mean by that is they would take like a 150 part per million of lead and, it, and put that in the water and expose that through the filter and then test the water that comes out the other side. And in the um, testing that they've done, it's proven to, to remove those levels. Well, I should say reduce, reduce. those levels. Would it have a certain micron rating or? No, it doesn't have a micron rating specifically. So though they're a multi-purpose filter. So it's not just that they're a membrane filter, which would give you a micron rating or, um, or just a charcoal filter. They typically are, are, they're trying to take some of that scientific nature out of it and make it simple by just saying NSF ANSI 53 certified to reduce lead. Because we currently use a charcoal one micron just for the taste of the water. Um, would we replace that with this NF58 or add it in addition to it? Um, it depends on if the housing manufacturer makes a cartridge that will work in there that's ANSI NSF53 certified. Basically, there's a page that comes with all of the filters on the inside, and that's all the fine print of all of the certifications and testing that it's been rated for. And the best way to know what it's rated for and what it'll reduce is to read that fine print on that page. Uh, we do have some, you know, Oakland County and uh, um, NHS, DHHS. DHHS are out front. Um, they do have some filters out there, and I think that, um, you know, take a look at those. They There's a lot of different models out there. Um, they probably have some some handouts that they can give you. If they are out of those, um, if you want to contact our office tomorrow, I have some copies of those digitally that I can email you. Okay, another question. Hello, I'm Mike. I just had uh, two questions, actually separate questions, one for White Lake and one for the state as well, please. You, White Lake, you said you were involved in speaking with Dublin Elementary School, and we talked about the water fountains there. Oh, whoops, we lost it. You said they have the correct filtration in place for that water filter or water fountain. Is that, are you talking about the refill portion of it or the fountain itself or both? And then a follow up to that is, is there a certain period of time that that filter is working properly and then it, the lifespan of it goes off and needs to be uh, replaced? Uh, yeah, so I, I have been in contact with the principal at Dublin. Um, so generally most of those drinking fountains, the, the filter covers both the drinking fountain it, portion and the bottle fill station. Um, they do have a replaceable filter cartridge. Um, and uh, I, would, I would ask the, uh, if, if you're concerned about that, I would, I would direct that school to question to the school. Um, so I don't know what the frequency that they're replacing those is. Um, but the, the school officials will certainly there help. there's an indicator on those devices that tells you when you need to change the cartridge and part of the certification for that filter cartridge is that when that indicator is green or yellow that it is still removing the appropriate amount so when it hits the it's typically a light indicator that goes green yellow red when it hits red, they're challenge tested actually beyond that. So there's some time. It's not like, it. oh, it's red. Oh, no, we're in trouble. We're getting lead. There's, there's a little time in there. But as long as they're following the manufacturer's recommendation in, in directions on when to change those, then that certification holds. Okay, but you also, you said it, it, when you spoke with them there, and I'm not going to hold you to this because you can't control what they're doing. Uh, but he did indicate it was going to be the NSF 53 filter on it. Yeah, he did indicate that they have brand new uh, drinking bar, drinking fountain water bill, water fill stations. Excuse me, I'm a little parched. Um, he also indicated that they have recently replaced all of their faucets. Okay. So they're, they're doing um, quite a bit to, to be proactive about this kind of stuff. And they had already done that prior to this notification. This, this was something that they... Okay. I think worked on last year. 
Okay, thank you. And then the other portion I had for the state here, we discussed earlier, we were talking about NSF 53 filters and water softeners and potentially making the water in the home more corrosive. So it really, and correct me if I'm not saying this correctly, but um, because it makes the water more corrosive that may not be actually helpful to be filtering it out before it makes it to your faucets that may add contaminants. So is, is there, the recommendation wouldn't really to be to, an NSF 53 filter for a whole house actually wouldn't be helpful either because contaminant is really coming further down the line, correct? Yeah, we're, we're confusing a few topics there. Okay. Um, so I'll straighten that out. That's you could put a whole house NSF 53 filter in and that would not necessarily make the water corrosive in the home. We were talking about a whole house water softener may make the home water more corrosive. Or an RO unit. Or an RO unit may make the home water more corrosive. But typically these cartridge filters that are certified to remove lead do not do that. Okay, anyone else have the question? Oh, another part? You might not be quite. Just so I understand it correctly, I understand there are two separate things, but if I used an NSF 53 filter, which I haven't been able to find one that is a whole house water filter for, for what my uh, housing sure. holds, yep. but let's pretend I could find one, it really wouldn't be that helpful because we're saying probably in these houses older than 1988, the contaminants being picked up beyond That's correct. that. Yeah. Correct. You yeah. would be better off filtering with one of these filters at the point of use. Yeah, because if you have a whole home filter, it's still sitting in those pipes, it's still sitting in contact with those faucets, and if it's there long enough, it'll still pick up those metals after the filter. Yep. Any other questions? Well, one thing everybody should know is that the water department, the DPS, is available. All you have to do is call. Uh, Aaron's uh, group is really well versed in all this and we're here to try to make sure we get as much information out as we can and we want to be as open and transparent about it as possible. Uh, the, the action was taken uh, after we detected, excuse me, after the state returned, uh, there was a timeline and I don't think you went completely over that, but there was a, it was a really, really rapid turnaround to get out to the public because, uh, you know, in cases where there's been communities that didn't necessarily get things out in time, uh, the law is very clear. Uh, but one of the things that we have to do as a community is that once we are noticed, we have to craft our answer to the public and send it back to the state. And the state has to approve that answer to the public so that it's all factual. And uh, the return time on that was super, super quick, I know, and we, we, we tried to get on this right away. So again, this is not a health advisory, it's an action advisory. So it's just, a, it sets the bell off that says, hey, there's potentially a problem here. And that's what everyone has to be aware of. And the point that you made is that, you know, you don't necessarily need to be on the municipal system. You could be on a rural well in, in the north end of the, uh, of the, the community. Run your water a little bit, you know, and, and you may want to have it tested just to be safe because you really don't know the history. Unless you built that house with your two hands and you know when it was done, you don't know the history or, or the uh, chain of possession, so to speak, as it's called when they do testing. They want to make sure that they know exactly where, who had what and when they had it. So that chain of ownership throughout the house, you, you have no idea what someone may have done to your house. Um, I live in currently a house right now that I don't even know when it was built. It was probably built in the 30s, okay? And I've gone through and, and done things to it. And now I'm thinking, hmm, maybe I need to test my water. So these were all good points. And I want to thank everybody tonight for coming here and uh, all of the hard work that uh, Aaron's done in the state and the, the county and all the other resources that we have available to us and we'll continue to do so. And we will have continuous updates on this at our township meetings. It'll be a kind of an FYI. So 
again, if you can attend the meetings, it's very important. Although we don't have a whole lot of room, and if too many of you come, it causes a problem. So we, we only have capacity for like 76 people. But you can tune in and watch, and we will be responsive to all of your inquiries. And if not, you know, just come up to the township, ask questions. That's why we're there. We work for you. Thank you very much, and good night. Thank you, Thank you.